There are more than 450,000 individuals in the United States who require renal replacement therapy or dialysis. These individuals continue to lead full and productive lives. I'm Dr. John Kevin Tucker, a kidney specialist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Vice President for Education at Mass General Brigham, and this is Understanding Dialysis Options, Hemodialysis. When patients develop chronic kidney disease, and the kidney function declines to a level such that the kidneys are no longer able to support life, that is when the patient will develop some of the signs and symptoms of kidney failure, many of which are nonspecific. They may include things like nausea, loss of appetite, fatigue, mental cloudiness, itching. There is no one sign or symptom that occurs in all patients, but it's a really a constellation of findings that suggests that the patient needs to begin dialysis because of these findings that are suggestive of kidney failure. Kidney transplantation is the most optimal form of renal replacement, but there aren't enough kidneys to go around. So most patients rely, at least in the short term, on one of the means of dialysis. There are two major forms of dialysis, hemodialysis, which involves the blood, and peritoneal dialysis, which does not involve blood. It's possible for patients to move from one modality of dialysis to another. Kidney dialysis is a life-sustaining form of therapy that allows our patients who've lost their kidney function to maintain normal lives. The choice most often depends upon personal choice, lifestyle, life situation, change in employment, or change in school status that necessitates a change from one modality to another. There are some patients for whom hemodialysis is the preferred dialysis option because peritoneal dialysis may not be feasible because of, for example, prior abdominal surgery. Patients who have had prior abdominal surgery may have scar tissue in the abdomen that makes peritoneal dialysis not workable. Hemodialysis involves taking blood from the body running it through a machine that removes the poisons and excess fluid and then returns it to the body. It's typically done in a clinic on a three times per week schedule, but can also be done at home, that is, home hemodialysis. There's new equipment that's come online in the last 20 years or so that allows the use of a small, relatively portable machine that's easy to use for patients. Just as we train patients to do home peritoneal dialysis, we can train patients to do home hemodialysis. On average, in the United States, most patients on in-center hemodialysis dialyze three and a half to four hours. That is three and a half to four hours in the chair connected to the machine, three times per week. For patients who do home hemodialysis, they do, I would say on average, five to six days per week of treatments but for two and a half to three hours on average. So shorter time, but more treatments. In order to perform hemodialysis, we need access to the circulation or to the blood. And there are two ways in which we can typically gain access to the circulation. One is by placement of a catheter, typically in the neck. The other preferred way is by an AV fistula, AV standing for arterial venous. That means that the surgeon ties together an artery and a vein in the arm, so the vein becomes dilated over time to accommodate two needles, one to draw blood from the body and one to return the purified blood back to the body. The reason that the fistula is preferred is that it has no foreign material and it doesn't get infected. A catheter, we always have to worry about an infection because it's a foreign body. The dialysis procedure itself generally doesn't cause pain or discomfort. However, if the patient has an AV fistula, two needles have to be placed into it. In order to alleviate some of the pain with needle placement, we'll give some of our patients an analgesic cream, which they'll apply at home before they come to dialysis. And that analgesic cream will help to alleviate some of the pain that the patient may experience with placement of the needles into the fistula. The multidisciplinary team will see the in-center hemodialysis patient in the clinic. The nephrologist or kidney doctor will round on the patient in the clinic. The dialysis nurse is supervising the treatment at each and every treatment. The social worker will meet with the patient on a regular basis to help the patient navigate the complex medical and social needs of a dialysis patient. The dietitian guides the patient 
through nutritional management on dialysis. Protein intake is very important to maintaining optimal health in patients on dialysis. So the dietitian is going to review protein intake, review foods that are important in terms of protein content for the patient, but also help the patient to manage dietary restrictions such as potassium and phosphorus. The training process for home hemodialysis is a little bit more technically complex than the training for home peritoneal dialysis. So the training takes longer, typically six weeks to two months at a minimum. The patient will come into the clinic at least once per month to meet with the multidisciplinary team. During those multidisciplinary visits, the patient may have any medications administered by the nurse that need to be given in the clinic. For example, intravenous iron or erythropoietin to prevent anemia. Before we discharge the patient from the clinic to do dialysis at home, a home visit is required by law. So the dialysis nurse will go out to the home to make sure that the home environment is safe for the patient to perform dialysis at home. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. John Kevin Tucker, and we are Mass General Brigham.